Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome to one of my first Aerospace Dimension videos. Now, in some of my previous videos on this channel, I have done Learn to Lead topics, and it was requested that I do some Aerospace Dimensions. And so, since I have gone through, through the entire cadet program, I thought it might be useful that I go through some of the Aerospace Dimensions and Journey of Flight books, just so that you guys kind of have a brief summary of what everything is talking about, and if you want to have a discussion with me about some of the content, or if you have questions, then feel free to leave a comment down below. If you are enjoying my content, I do ask that you either like, comment, or subscribe on the videos, because the YouTube algorithm, the mother algorithm, enjoys more interactions on the channel because it shows that you guys are enjoying the content. So, any and all support is greatly appreciated, so we're going to jump right into it. The beginning of the Aerospace Dimensions section one of the first book, so the module one, it talks about the origin of flight. And it talks about how man was always like, I want to learn how the birds fly. Why can't we, these beings, fly? We want to one day be in the sky with the birds. So if you're familiar with the wonderful Greek myth about Daedalus and his son, Icarus, it talks about how Daedalus, he was a great inventor in Greek society, or at least in Greek myth, and he, he created the labyrinth, he created a weird cow thing, he also created wings. And what happened was, he and his son were trying to escape the, the Minoan civilization, and by doing so, the only way that he thought they could escape was through the sky. And so he fashioned these wings out of feathers and out of wax, and then attached them to his arms and to his son Icarus's arms. And the myth goes that he said, don't go too high and don't go too low, just stay right in the middle, which is also known as the golden mean. You don't need to know this for the test, but it's, it's just little fun facts about the Greek mythology. And Icarus, being the curious little boy that he was, he flew up. He flew too close to the sun, his wings melted, and thus he crashed into the sea. Daedalus did find his son Icarus, but that is part of the myth that I'm not going to go into at this point. So if you're interested more in that, feel free to look at more information about the myth. There's plenty of videos out there talking about how that's involved with Greek mythology overall. But that myth shows that man has always had this like innate, innate wonder and passion to understand how flying works and like how can man one day fly. Later on in history, things like kites, hot air balloons, and other devices were created to kind of figure out how man can eventually get into the air and like be with the birds. The first war that hot air balloons were used for was the Civil War actually, and they were they were used to scout out areas and kind of like watch down to see what the enemy troops were doing, just kind of to have that sort of strategic advantage. And over time, aerospace has really played a huge role in the effectiveness of any army. The Montgolfer brothers were the first ones to create a functional hot air balloon that could go up in the air and like work properly. And then in, I think it was 1783, a man named Pilatre de Roser, I think, and de Allendes, they had a 25 minute long flight where they got up in the balloon and they just kind of moved in the balloon and then went plop back down. It's not a very long flight and there are some flights out there right now that are like 16 to 20 hours long, but Imagine in that time period, no one had ever really flown before for any given distance. So just being able to go for 25 minutes in the air was really astounding. So the next major concept that the module talks about is Bernoulli's principle. And there are a few videos out there that I can definitely link to this video, but just to keep it short and brief, let's, let's take an example of these two pieces of paper. You see how they are? So if I just blow on one, what do you think will happen to the paper? I'll blow on it, ready? Right? It blows up just a little bit. Now the weight of the paper is probably a little heavy for this demonstration. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rip it in half and see if this works better. So I'm gonna blow on the paper. You see how it blows? So if I have two papers that are right next to each other, what do you think is going to happen? Whoop, excuse me. Let me see if this, this works a little bit better. So. so what happens is they get closer together. Why do you think that is? Bernoulli's principle states that the faster the velocity is of the air particles that are moving, the lower the pressure will be. And vice versa, the slower 
that the velocity is, the higher the pressure will be. So that's just a small demonstration here. With my pieces of paper, you saw how the pa pieces of paper got closer together? Ugh. I don't know if I can do this effectively. Wait, I'll do it again. I'll do it, I'll do it. They come together. That's because there's a lower pressure, and so there's higher pressure on the outside of the papers, and then they go just like that. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about Sir Isaac Newton, and he has three laws. The first law is an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by another force. So let's take my pen for example. We've got my pen. My pen, it will sit here on my hand. Nothing's going to happen to my pen. But if I just, just so happen to let it go, the action of gravity will pull it down. So it is being acted upon by gravity. Another example you can think of, another example that might be good to think of is there might be a ball sitting on the floor and then if you like poke it with your finger, like it's a lighter ball, it's like a bouncy ball, you know? If you poke that bouncy ball, you just give it a light nudge, it's going to move and then it'll eventually stop, which adds in friction and a few other things. We're not gonna go into those because you do not need to know those, but it is good to know that an object at rest will stay at rest until it is acted upon by something else. The second one is force equals mass times acceleration. So it's just basically taking like the total amount of force being done on an object will equal the mass of the object and the acceleration that it's being moved. The third law is that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if you think about where you are currently sitting or standing, depending on who you are, and if you watch your video standing like some people, like me, then you will see that you are applying a downward force because of gravity. Therefore, the thing that you are standing on or sitting on is applying the exact same amount of force back at you. And then there's equilibrium. So if I push on my wall, it is applying the same amount of force back at me. So I'm going to show you an airfoil. Ta-da! This is an airfoil. An airfoil has different parts and the wing of an airplane is shaped like an airfoil because it allows the generation of lift in a very specific way. So there's the leading edge, right? There's the leading edge, which is at the very front, which it has to be smooth in order for smooth airflow to go over or under the wing. If it were a flat surface, then the air molecules would want to hit flat against it and wouldn't have a smooth flow over the wing. They would ricochet off. And that isn't really good for generating lift or being able to effectively use the wing. There is the cord, which is the line that goes between the front, like the leading edge, to the trailing edge, which is the back of the airfoil. We have the upper portion, which is called the upper camber, and then the lower camber. And those surfaces, they come together at the trailing edge, and then there's your airfoil. Just a quick disclaimer, this video won't go over every single thing that you need to know for the Module 1 Aerospace Dimensions book. It's just kind of a brief explanation of everything, and I want to have that discussion with you guys. So if you do have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Now jumping back into it, let's get into the next section. It talks about angle of attack. What is angle of attack? Angle of attack is where you have the wing of the airplane. So let's talk about our airfoil. So let's let's say that my hand is the, the airfoil right here. This, well, it does not look like a good airfoil, but it's an airfoil, right? So the angle of attack is the relative wind coming at the wing and the angle of that airfoil. So there is something called a critical angle of attack on airplanes and if you go past a certain point where the relative wind versus the wing is and it will no longer create any lift which can create something called a stall which means the plane is no longer generating lift and you'll start to get pulled down by gravity. So just know that the angle of attack is the relative wind versus the airfoil and the leading edge of the airfoil and that difference of angle between the two. So it's airfoil, relative wind, and then that angle is the angle of attack, and then the critical angle of attack is when the wing would no longer generate any lift. I'm gonna bring back my little duck of fun. He's going to explain the four forces acting upon an airplane when it is flying. So there's, there's lift, so the lift is the upward force. There is gravity, which is the downward force. And then if he's flying this way, so let's say he's flying this way. So this way is thrust, and then that way would be drag. So lift, gravity, or weight, because weight is determined by gravity. And then you've got your 
thrust, and drag. There are also three different axes that we need to know about. So there is pitch, which is the, like, if you're talking about the pitch of the plane, it's the angle of the nose, right? We talked about the angle of the nose versus the relative wind, right? So that, that motion, right, like this, if you, this is the front of the plane, this motion is pitch, and then we've got roll, roll. So if this was the plane, this would be roll. And then yaw is the side to side motions. So if you think about a rudder, do you know what a rudder is? You don't need to know quite what a rudder is, but it's something on the back of the vertical stabilizer on an airplane. And it determines what the yaw is of the plane. The rudder just helps prevent the plane from like skidding in the air. It's not exact, but it's, it's just kind of a way to think about it. So the, the yaw is controlled by the rudder of the plane and then you've got your your ailerons to kind of determine which direction you're going, like lifting one wing up or lifting the other wing up or maybe maintaining straight and level flight. And then power, or like the throttle, determines the altitude. So you're going up and down. You don't quite need to know this for the chapter, I'm just adding in my private pilot knowledge for you guys if you're interested in that kind of stuff. I'm not doing ground lessons, I'm not a certified instructor, I'm just saying things that I know. It, the chapter does go in a little bit more depth than I'm planning on going on, like about how the propeller works and what the nose is and like all of that information. If you want to understand better about what the different components of the airplane are and what each of those components do, please feel free to check out videos. I will have some links on this video to also explain those concepts if you are more interested in those, but you don't need to go as in depth about that. It's just that the, the <laughs> propeller on an airplane, those determine the thrust of the airplane. Okay, then the last section talks a little bit about UAVs. I think if you want to know more about UAVs, the chapter doesn't really nearly go in as much depth as you would probably want if you want to at least have an overall understanding. It's UAV stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, and that means it is you are not in the vehicle when it is flying. So typically, if you understand what flight simulator is, where you're like sitting at your computer and you're controlling the airplane, it's basically like that, except you're controlling an actual device out in the real world. Uh, there are a few specialties in the military if you're interested in UAVs, and there's also some civilian jobs that are available for UAVs. At the end of the module, there are a few activities, and I highly recommend doing them. I myself will not be doing them on the channel, but if you are interested, go ahead and check those out. So that completes my summary of Section 1 of Module 1 in the Aerospace Dimensions book. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, trivia, or any other information that you would like me to know, or interactions you'd like to have with me, please feel free to leave a comment down below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and that is all, folks. Until next time, toodles.